Welcome back. It's now 26 minutes to 7 o'clock on the 16th day of November 2020. And you're watching Dread Break. And I want us now to focus on what's informing conversations, or maybe not, because of uh, the trends that are witnessing in the country. And to help us do that, we have uh, the governor of Isolo County, who is uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed Kuti. We also have Dr. Chibanzi Mwachonda, who is the acting secretary general of the KMPDU. And we have uh, Senator Sylvia Kasanga, the chairperson of the health, uh, I mean, the COVID-19 ad hoc committee at the Senate. And shortly will be joined by the Senator of Homa Bay, Moses Kajuang. But before we dive into the conversation, I want us to take a look at um, the trends that we've been seeing in the COVID-19 pandemic over the past few days to weeks and months. And uh, we start with the uh, so far where we are, the total infections at 70,245. And this is after 789,000 samples have been tested. And out of that, 1.8% have died, 65% have recovered, and therefore the active cases are 33%. But this number sometimes is um, not very clear because we do not know where every other person who contracted the virus is. Some of them are unaccounted for. If you are to look at uh, the past one week, this is how it looks. That uh, since um, Monday last week until yesterday, 7,757 7, new infections were reported. That's a daily average of 1,108. That is the highest anywhere um, since the pandemic hit the country in March. Then the deaths, the fatalities have been 158 over the past seven days. That's a daily average of 23, pretty high if you compare <coughs> with the history of the pandemic in the country. As something else to look at is um, the week in review. We are talking about the samples that have been tested. This could be the highest on, on record in the country, 47,471 samples tested, out of which 16.3% have um, returned positive results. That's again, uh, could be the highest weekly <coughs> positive rate, if you are to call it so. Then something else to look at in the numbers of COVID-19. Well, talking about the weekly tracking, this is how the numbers have been moving uh, from the 21st week, which was somewhere around August. Uh, you can see how, how it, it has been going up. I'm talking about the weekly numbers you just saw there that we had 7,000 uh, 757 new infections reported in the 34th week. We don't know where we're headed in the 35th week that is coming, but you can see clearly the curve The curve is actually higher than the initial peak that uh, we were said to have hit in the month of July. Uh, something else to look at is coming from where we have been in terms of the monthly uh, infections. Look at that. Look at how the graphs have been moving. And this is important because if you look at the month of October, the total is not there, but um, the month of October had 16,663 infections. In November, we've been just into it for 15 days. That's halfway. And already we're reporting more than 15,000 infections. That's way higher, a daily average of more than 1,000. Compare that to the daily average of October, which is at 537. So really going higher and higher. Finally, let's, let's also let, take a look at um, the monthly fatalities. And this is um, where it gets sad, because if you have to look at um, where we are, this the month of November, already at 273 and promising to go higher. Again, it's just been 15 days in, in November. In October, we had the highest fatality rate of 285 in a whole month. Uh, of course, the earlier one was in August at 236. But all indications are clear. We could be doubling that number of 273 in the next 15 days. Something else to look at in as, in as far as the, the trends are concerned is the positivity rate. Like I said, we might have just witnessed the highest positivity rate in a week because if you look at those numbers, uh, the positivity rate has been uh, going up and down since the 1st of November. I believe at the highest it was at 18% around 4th of November. Something else is uh, the county's burden that you see the numbers highest in Nairobi continues to consistently lead at 31,454, but also the traditional lead counties are still at the top with Mombasa with 6,498. Remember there's a time they were told to have hit a peak. It appears now they are back maybe to the second peak or second wave or whatever you call it. Kiambu 4,419, Nakuru 3,597, 3, and that's how they follow each other. So the top counties are Nairobi, Mombasa, Kiambu, Nakuru, and Kajado. And I want to begin with you, Governor of Isiolo, who is also the chair of the uh, health committee at the Council of Governors. And Governor, of course, you see the trends that you're witnessing and the situation promising that you might be recording the highest number of COVID-19 in November uh, since the pandemic began. What does this tell you at the Council of Governors and what are you learning as uh, the team that is leading um, health uh, interventions in these counties? 
Well, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, what we learned is that uh, now we are in a second wave and uh, a more serious one. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we've been balancing between the economic impact of this disease and the disease itself and the impact on the health of the people. Right, right, Governor, we appear to be having a challenge. Um, I, I don't know that it's some, somebody who called you. You're making a point on uh, that you're learning you're in the second wave. You've been trying to balance between uh, the pandemic itself and dealing with it. Please continue. Uh, I was saying that uh, we are... Well, unfortunately, we appear to be losing the governor. We try to reconnect and uh, get on with what he was, uh, um, at the point he was making. But Dr. Chibansi Mwachonda, of course, uh, we've been hearing you um, very vocal about the welfare of the healthcare workers, and we'll get into that later on. But when you look at um, this infection rate, I remember the time that uh, the country believed to be in the peak, that was in July. We didn't hit the numbers like we have in October and what is promising in November. Uh, from your colleagues, what do you think is going to happen in the coming days based on the patterns we're witnessing now and comparing that to the intervention mechanisms that are already in place and what the country is doing? Uh, thank you, Sam. I think comparing July and now uh, is good because in July, we were yet to ease some of the restrictions that were in place. After July, we've seen heightened political activity. We've seen super spreader events. And, and those are the ones that have resulted in the current situation. Thing. We have to be alive to the fact that COVID-19 is spread through contact. Before July, we had certain restrictions in place, but after that, now with those easing of the restrictions and allowing all these political activities, the mass gatherings, we also have bars and bars open, and we've seen clearly Kenyans are violated, even the bar owners, people staying beyond the cup time and closing and behaving like everything is normal. So that is the result of what we have undertaken. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. And uh, Senator Sylvia Kasanga, let me bring you on in, into this conversation before we get into the details. And um, of course, you've been uh, working so hard listening to different agencies, but also conducting uh, tours to various counties. I mean, as you started your work early in the pandemic um, path in the country, did you foresee a situation where we would be where we are reporting an average of more than a thousand infections in the country? Uh, thank you, Sam, and good morning again. And Sam, yes, yes, the projections had been such that we may find ourselves in this situation. And uh, the whole purpose of trying to flatten the curve, which I know a lot of Kenyans maybe still don't understand, the curfews and the fast restrictions that were done were, of course, to slow down the rate of, uh, of uh, infection, which is technically what meant, you know, flattening the curve, so that we don't have as many high cases as we are seeing right now that would then burden our very delicate healthcare infrastructure as, as we are seeing now as we speak. So this was expected. And the whole idea of the Ministry of Health uh, tasking the county governments to make certain preparations was of course in anticipation mm -hmm. that the counties will have to step in, that the spread is going to you know um, be, be beyond Nairobi and Mombasa, as we had seen in the initial stages. It was expected that the counties will also experience a surge and that the counties needed to have prepared to a certain level, which is what the Ministry of Health had tasked them to do. And when they send down the funds, that is what the uh, Council of Governors was supposed to be uh, busy preparing, uh, preparing for. So this does not come as a surprise, although, of course, it is sad that, uh, as Dr. Chibanzi is talking about, the super spreader events mm -hmm. and, uh, ha happened, and that is why we are seeing this sudden surge, which is the very thing that the Ministry of Health was working hard towards, you know, and of course the national response team. This was the purpose of the lockdowns, this was the purpose for the restrictions, and because now the balance of the economy uh, meant that we needed to take still a lot of precaution so that we make sure that the infection rate is not uh, sudden or, you know, a spike because our delicate healthcare system, um, you know, it, it, can't, it can't really handle, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, Sam, I just want to remind you, you know, our committee actually wound up and we are doing our exit report. But we do have a lot of material with how much, um, you know, the Ministry of Health in their last report 
uh, to us the report that was for 9th September, mm -hmm. where the Ministry of Health was reporting back to the committee after we had issued a series of further questions as to how much they have done. And also against the backdrop of where the Ministry of Health had gone down to the counties and done their own report and their own assessment of the preparedness of the counties. And even by then, the Ministry of Health did report uh, the, the fact that, you know, a lot of the counties were not prepared. Mm -hmm. And this is as much as the Ministry of Health has devolved and make sure there is enough testing. Well, there's at least a good number of testing centers that are happening around the county mm -hmm. counties, although it again is still in a backdrop of where, you know, reagents are still difficult to find, considering the whole world is using the same reagents. Right. So there was really need to step up uh, the, um, the slowing down of the, of the spread of the COVID. But of course, when the super spreader events happened, now mm -hmm. we are seeing this impact. And you see, this impact is going to continue for a while. I think I listened to Dr. Chibanzi saying that what happened, you know, the BBI popularization that happened around the counties, we are going to see the effect of that. It's like we lit a fire. We lit a fire in our dry forest, and we're going to see the impact of that. I'll tell you some. When mm. we went to Mombasa, if you remember my report on Mombasa, and we said, you know, Mombasa seems to have ticked the boxes when it comes to preparedness. Right. And some of the areas where we had a challenge with them was, of course, frontline workers and paying their dues and giving them their motivation and things like that. But in Mombasa, at that time we went, the isolation centers were being collapsed because they were not being used at that time. Right. You see, and they had set up smaller isolation units now around the counties, which we thought was also, you know, a good thinking uh, process. But now after the, you know, the super spreader events, let me call them that, the mm -hmm. few rallies that you saw, and they were really mega in Mombasa and in uh, and Kwale. Right now, Mombasa is really struggling from the reports that we are getting. The senator has complained severely on the floor of the house that Mombasa is in a dire state. And you've seen it even on TV with the governor now trying to put enforcement measures where he right. himself is going to lock down um, a bars and, and at night. But, you know, we forget that these super spreader events should never have happened in the first place. So, okay. Sam, we are in a serious situation right now. Yes. And, you know, I really feel it for our frontline workers. In fact, my heart goes out to them because we really try to fight uh, for their for their rights and we still continue to. And, um, and, and, and yeah, and, and for, 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 the sake of, um, for the sake of clarity, Dr. Chibanzi, so, uh, of course, there's that reference to the super spreader events, but is there scientific evidence to show that a certain event from that event, let's say the Mashujade event in Kisi County has led to a spike in the COVID-19 numbers in um, uh, in Kisi County, but specifically of people that attended that event? Or is it just that the thinking that because people are coming together, uh, they are likely now to catch the virus? Sam, your question really amuses me, sorry to say. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> science is how does this disease spread? And, and it's, it's very clear. Um, earlier on in the pandemic in, in South Korea, you saw one mosque event where 300 people led to a complete uh, increase, in over 100% increase in the number of cases in South Korea. You know, globally, that is known. So we, we are at, at a point where, yes, there's no study that has been done because also remember that we have a very weak contact tracing. We, we, we not, we're not one of those countries that can basically locate each and every single person that attended an event as big as a Mashuja Day and then look at do have they reported symptoms or not. Mm -hmm. um, our system is not that well 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 strengthened. Our system does not have that capacity. But the reality is this uh, gatherings in which a disease spreads simply by talking to the next person. And you know we've seen Kenyans, even politicians, putting the masks on the chin or mm -hmm. when you're addressing the, 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 the gathering, you have your mask off, you know. And no one knows amongst that crowd who has the disease. But I'll, I'll refer you to the Cambridge study mm -hmm. that in June, already in June, showed that out of the zero prevalence, we're looking at antibodies, 1.3 million seem to have contracted the disease, but then they were symptomatic. So right. that gives you, that, that those are studies trying to give you a picture of what exactly is happening in the country. Mm -hmm. Because the Confirmation testing, the SARS, it's a PCR testing, which we've never done 10,000 cases, 10,000 tests in a day. Right. You see, we don't have that capacity. We're only doing 7,000. So the reality is that super spreader events have been proven scientifically gatherings to be spreading events. It's spreading COVID-19. It's as simple as that. Right. Of course, um, uh, you said the question is interesting, but uh, you agree with me that uh, we are not at that point where we're able to really 
uh, trace specific cases to specific, specific events. But uh, Governor Kuti, so on the 20th of September 2020, yourself and other government officers, uh, top govern, government officers met at the KICC. And of course, we're taking stock of uh, the fight against the, the, the pandemic. And uh, I'm told that you don't have the governor. But uh, Senator Kasanga, if you can hear me, at that event, you were told of how well we had done in as far as preparing to contain the pandemic. Did we rush to lift some of the measures? Is it time now to regret and looking back, what failed us? Is it the science that we had or is it the political uh, greed to go back to rallies? Uh, some, I think uh, it's been clear. Uh, it's been clear that it was a balance of the economics, that is livelihoods and lives. You see, it was a balance and a delicate balance. You cannot contain hungry people. And as it is a country, uh, you know, our economy has not been good for a while. COVID has just come to send us further deep into, into, the, you know, into the pains of a bad economy. And Kenyans were feeling it. And the country does not have the capacity as well to give enough stimulus packages to contain and to help Kenyans uh, who have lost business and lost their livelihood. So there was need to balance uh, the two. And it is not so much for the greed of uh, politicians to go back to the rallies. Mm -hmm. But yes, of course, we do have the BBI you know, in the background. That is, as you can see, there's need to popularize the BBI. But that did not play out when it was time to open up. What, what I think what was a focus for the government at that time, the response team, is to make sure the Kenyans have livelihoods, that they can go back and, uh, you know, uh, make a little money mm -hmm. and start, you know, jump-starting their businesses back again. I think the problem here, and I have said this uh, previously before, is the fact that the, con the in enforcement measures were relaxed. Right. You can open up the economy, but the enforcement measures needed to have been there. Why did the government allow for rallies to take place, considering a lot of the leaders are the ones who are the front line? So leaders failed Kenyans in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. It was not opening up. Again, the Ministry of Health and the Response Team needed to ensure that, you know, their officers on the ground as businesses are opening up, that they are going around and checking on those enforcement measures. There are a lot of restaurants that you go to and you can see there's a lot of laxity. And we know a lot of COVID, again, science has told us. And we, we, don't, we should not be forgetting, we are, we are very forgetful people. But mm -hmm. we have also learned about, you know, surfaces, not washing hands properly. Of course, when you're in a restaurant setting, it's a social setting, you need to observe social distance and things like that. A lot of relaxation of that has happened in the marketplaces and things like that. So there needed to have been enforcement measures that are still continuing, even as the economy was being opened up. And, you know, also schools going back. And a lot of economies globally, you have seen that they have tried to keep the enforcement measures on even as businesses are slowly opening up. So it is not so much that, um, you know, that politicians were hungry to go for for elections, I mean, sorry, for campaigns, for right. the BBI, but yes, there was a backdrop of that, and that is the reason why we are seeing all, all, this, all this happening, Sam. Right, and even as uh, that balance was being considered, Dr. Chibanzi, so if you look at... Um at the time that we, these measures were being lifted on the 20th of September, we were at 30,168 infections, and now there's an increment of 32,077 infections. That's um, more than 84%. Did we rush, or did we consider everything that we needed to look at before congratulating ourselves for a job well done? I think there was no rush. Um, <laughs> Senator Kasanga has been very clear that um, it had to be a balance. But let me tell you, Part of the other problem, apart from the super spreader events, when the measures were eased, the restriction, the restrictive measures were eased, it was interpreted that COVID is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the unfortunate thing. That's the other thing that we are not we are not talking about. Because right from you could hear Kenyans saying, "Sasa COVID in Asia, we are now okay." You see, so now everyone dropped the ball completely. And then let me say also that you see. Our political leaders, and I'm not saying this in bad faith, our political leaders are significant opinion shapers of the public in this country and in any other country. Mm -hmm. So if the politicians themselves behave in a manner that COVID in Asia, the mm -hmm. public will fall. And you see, that, that is what also happened. So it's not an issue of we, we, we rushed. We did not rush. We were balancing. The figures were looking good that, okay, fine, we can now attempt to, uh, to reopen. And this is not just in Kenya, Sam. Mm -hmm. There are so many countries in Africa, in Europe, that eased restrictions, but then had to go back to reinforce the restrictions because the infections were on the side, on the rise again. So it's, it wasn't, we didn't really rush. It's just an issue of handling that state, that that easing of restrictions, the right. messaging around 
to the public, the education to the, the civic education to the public, mm -hmm. and also how we handled ourselves in these events that had now been allowed to happen. Right, and uh, let's listen to some of the people that have been speaking about the situation in the country, including the governor of uh, Mombasa, uh, that is Ali Hassan Joho, who spoke over the weekend at a funeral of a member of county assembly of um, uh, Mombasa County. Listen. COVID is a reality. Take it from me. COVID is a reality. And even here today as we sit here, there's many of us who still don't believe that COVID is a reality. Leo, asubui peke yake, kulala kwa mka asubui tunapoteza madaktari wawili. Na jana tunapoteza mmoja. Kwa hiyo ni watatu, ndani ya masai 24. Last week, in Coast General alone, we had 38 or so positive health workers. Why did they become positive? Because they looked after you. They looked after us. We lost a nurse. We are not safe. We are, talking, we are casting aspersions even to what my colleague has said, to the quality of the masks and even the PPEs which are being produced even locally. Viongozi wetu wanapopatikana na ugonjwa kidogo hata wakukohoa tunaona wakichukua ndege wanaenda kutibiwa inchi za nje. Sisi wa Kenya na sisi wa uguzi ama sisi wa udumu wa afya katika inchi hii hatutakubali kugandamizwa na hivi karibuni ikiwa serikali haitabadilisha msimamo wao huenda tukaona maafa mengi katika inchi yetu ya Kenya. Shortly be joined by the governor of Isolo County as well as uh, the senator of Homa Bay County, that is Moses Kajuang. Uh, but um, Senator Kasanga, of course, uh, listening to those people that spoke there, we'll focus on the fate of the healthcare workers later. But if these numbers continue to rise, there's a time where the samples that were being sent were, were being tested are pretty low. I, of course, Dr. Chibanzi say, says we are yet to hit 10,000 mark on a daily basis, but at least we've been above 8,000. So what more must we do? Because the testing is happening, more infections are happening, but there are so many more people dying. What must we do, especially to the capacity of our hospitals across the country, to avoid these fatalities? Uh, Sam, <clears throat> there's something I've spoken on this platform before, and it is also a cause of concern for Kenyans. And a reason why we are here where we are. As I mentioned earlier, the Ministry of Health report uh, to us on the 9th of September did report that a lot of the counties were not prepared. In fact, in just looking at it right here now, when on the issue of isolation beds, for instance, the Ministry of Health had, had, uh, not, had noticed that the county facilities had 7,723 beds against a projected 14,100 beds. And don't forget that the counties had received already money, 5 billion shillings from from the Ministry of Health. Secondly, 45 counties that were assessed by the Ministry of Health, I'm actually making reference to their own report. Only seven counties met the minimum bed requirement of 300 isolation beds. That is a 15% uh, report, and that's, that's very low. And some of the worst for performing counties were even listed in that, including Nyamira, Kitui, Bomet, Wasingishu, Narok, Siaya, uh, Marsabit, West Pokot, Wajir, Tana River, you know, like that. Then the ICU beds, again, we had uh, a projected need of 317, and there was a gap of 58 ICU beds. And don't forget, ICU beds came with other challenges of lack of qualified personnel to run the ICU beds, like we had seen in Kilifi, mm -hmm. where they have ICU beds, but they have no personnel uh, to handle those ICU beds. Then uh, the, the ministry further reported that 17 counties did not have even a single ICU bed. A single ICU bed. This is at a time when counties have received money. The issue of uh, ICU infrastructure, like I have mentioned, availability of oxygen. A lot of the counties still lacked oxygen. Mm -hmm. And we all know how important oxygen is against the fight of, um, of this pandemic. So you can see that is a report from the Ministry of Health themselves. There was a serious gap when it came to the uh, accountability of funds that right. were sent to the counties. And this I have reported here before. We mm -hmm. heard from the County Assemblies Forum that none of the county assemblies were able to oversight the COVID funds that were sent from the Ministry of Health to the counties, as well as the county's uh, supplementary budgets that had been passed by the assemblies from down the counties. This gap is one of the reasons why we find ourselves where we are. And I really hope the Governor Kuti comes back mm -hmm. because he needs to explain to Kenyans, why is it that the Council of Governors, why did they block out the county assembly forums from doing their oversight role? And then again, I have to agree with uh, Dr. Chibansi, the role of legislators, which is also an oversight role. 
Why is it that we have not oversighted these funds as adequately and down to each and every coin? This five billion is a lot of money. It would have gone a long way to helping Kenyans and you know uh, and capacitating the counties, so that we are we don't find ourselves in maybe half the situation that we are finding ourselves you know in uh, right now. So this gap for me is a very big uh, issue that right. we need to have a, a genuine conversation about uh, as as counties. And let us not forget the role of NHIF. Now we know that NHIF is no longer testing and uh, you know helping Kenyans and helping compensate Kenyans for the costs of COVID treatment. Right. Ah, uh, now this is a situation we are also aware of because the Ministry of Health had projected that the NHIF will not have the capacity. Should should we find ourselves in a situation of a major spike? And that is now where we are at right now. NHIF does not have the capacity uh, to help Kenyans. So we we are in this situation, and and a big reason is because of the lack of accountability of, of money. Right. And this is a big challenge uh, for this country. And, and Dr. Chibans, we need to take a short break, but before we do so, from a doctor's um, a perspe perspective, if you had to look at um, the fatality rates, uh, before October, the highest had been in August with 236 uh, fatalities. Uh, but uh, in the month of July, which had the highest number of infections, the deaths were 193. So what is it that is changing? Is it that we are having more people with uh, comorbidities or is it that we are finding ourselves we are not able to care for critical patients because also the people that are dying are becoming younger and younger yeah so the first thing is uh, let me say this um let me start with the fact that uh, younger people this disease uh, some huh? i know there's a certain notion that this disease is taking people with comorbid condition or elderly people i can tell you last week there's a very fit young man, 28 years, who died in ICU here in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And it is because of the extent to which it affects your lungs. So you have no you have no guarantee that age is your is your backup, that I'm young, I will not die. No. That one Kenyans have to forget, and that's the reality. Now, when it comes to why have we lost so many this month, you've alluded to it partly. And, and you know, the, if you looked at the nation today morning, uh, the, 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 how the death of uh, the former MP uh, who died on Saturday, Mm -hmm. There was no oxygen in the local facility. There was no oxygen in even the next facility that he was taken. And eventually, he succumbed to the condition. So the reality also is that, sadly, that our ICU space is full now. And I'm saying this with so much confidence because two of the doctors who died last week were waiting for ICU space because ICU space was full. That's the other. And the fourth thing is that with an increasing number of infections, what we are seeing now is that we are seeing more people with severe disease going into hospital. You know, the saddest thing, and I'm not saying this to scare anyone, that's why it's important that you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Going into ICU is almost up to 90% chance of you not coming out of ICU alive. That is the reality that we are seeing. 90%? Yes. Wow. And I think on that note, we need to take a short break. We need to return to continue with this conversation, including the fate of healthcare workers that we know already the doctors and uh, uh, clinic officers are already threatening to go on strike if their welfare is not taken into consideration. We'll also be raising questions with Governor Mohamed Kuti, who was with us but having technical challenges to join the conversation on the specific questions on capacity at the different counties in this country. We're back after the break.